This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, the podcast that introduces you to the rich world of storytellers who share their personal journeys, creative processes, and the stories behind their stories, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and I'm thrilled to be part of your writing journey. If you're an aspiring writer, a literary enthusiast, or simply someone who believes in the transformative power of words, you've come to the right place. Every week, we'll pop the cork on the world of successful storytellers and give you a healthy pour of inspiration, insight, and empowerment. My mission is to help writers like you realize your full potential through the transformative and therapeutic power of writing. Whether you're just starting your literary voyage or looking to refine your craft, I'm here to provide you with the knowledge, inspiration, and encouragement you need to embark on your own storytelling adventure. So, are you ready to uncork your story and let your creativity flow? Uncorking a story is about to begin. Sit back, relax, and let the transformative magic of storytelling whisk you away. Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Richard Podkowski is a former United States Secret Service special agent, author, and law enforcement subject matter expert for the entertainment industry. He joins me today on Uncorking a Story to talk about his career and novel, The Walk-On. Welcome to Uncorking Story, Richard. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mike. I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, chat with you. Yeah, well, I'm excited to have you here, um, but I, I always like to start at the, at the beginning of an author's story. So uh, tell me, Richard, where does your story as an author begin? Wow. Well, for, for my baby novel, The Walk On, the story begins back in 2007, so 17 years ago. And um, it's, it's a little background. Uh, you know, I'm a writer. Uh, I started writing a little bit in high school, college. Went through my Secret Service career writing investigative reports and then uh, transitioned to, uh, to fiction. So in 2007, while I was ra raising my family, I um, just had an idea popping in my head. Professional athletes were really getting in trouble in the National Football League in 2007. Specifically, uh, Michael Vick, if you, if you remember the quarterback, uh, got into a, a, a really bad uh, issue with dog fighting. And there were a couple other players in and around that time that yeah, were also. Um, got in, in trouble with the law. And, and you know, if you look at professional athletes in general, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, soccer, it seems like um, they get involved in things like uh, domestic violence, drugs, alcohol, you know, maybe bad financial decisions. And, and it seems like during that time, I found inspiration. Um, and I created this character. He's, he's a, uh, a middle linebacker. The Mike the Steel Man Stolowski plays for the fictional NFL team, the Chicago Storm. Well, um, I, he's kind of a composite character of, of a lot of notorious middle line kickers that have played in the NFL. And I just, I had an inspiration to write a story of redemption because uh, Michael Vick is a perfect story, you know, example of a story of redemption because, you know, he went, went to jail, got out. Um, he got it, got back into sports. I, he, he did play again, if my memory served me correctly. So, you know, I was in the answer, but I wanted to uh hone in on, on professional athletes who initially are heroes in the media, you know, for one reason or another, you know, they're popular players, accomplished players. And then something goes bad personally, and then you know at one at, at one point you are crazy in the media, and then you're vilified. You know you're you're torn apart. So I wanted to tell a story about a professional athlete who um, hometown hero. Uh, so the novel set in Chicago, and I wrote about when he really the lowest point in his life, and and got a second chance. So. The basic story of redemption is if you get a second chance in life, who's in your corner? Um, what what happens with your second chance? And are, and are you truly redeemed? And I think that is the basic theme that inspired me to write the novel. And you know, I was fortunate enough to get it published um, last February, February, uh, I'm sorry, February of 2023. 
Oh, wow. Okay. Oh. So, you know, a couple of things strike me about it. Number one, um, we all have a good redemption story. Um, mm-hmm. but, but also, you know, with, with professional athletes in, in particular, I think so many athletes come from a background where, you know, to say that they were living in poverty before they, they entered in, into professional sports is, you know, not an understatement, uh, many of them anyway, of course, not true for everybody. And then having so much money come to you so fast, I think it's, you know, you, you almost like kind of lose your mind a little bit sometimes, um, almost like lottery winners, you know, who don't know how to deal with, with everything that has just come their way. And so many of them go, you know, bankrupt after, after a short period of time. Um, it, was that part of your motivation to, to write this or? Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit. And I did touch on that, but, but, you know, my protagonist is actually a blue collar kid, you know, from the Southeast side of Chicago. Um, it's the old steel mills area. So it was a lot of hardworking people. Yeah, work there, you know, immigrants. Uh, I, mean, like, I think the Chicago Steel Mills, you know, formed in the late 1800s and really went out of business in the late 1870s. I'm originally from the south side of Chicago. And my story really showcases the grit and blitz of the city. And Chicago is a patchwork of neighborhoods, both good and bad. So, certain parts of the city is where athletes come out that. You're talking about, you know, guys that have uh, their roots in poverty and, you know, get all the all this instant fame and money, uh, you know, as, as a result of their athletic uh, abilities. Now, my protagonist, you know, he comes from um, a similar background, but He's really a, an introverted guy that develops this persona, this bad boy persona in the NFL. And if you look at the athletes that get this type of notoriety, you know, some of it is self-created, it's perpetuated by the media and encouraged a certain level of play. So that's where you get these characters. And I'm not gonna name you the characters, you know, that I based it on. A lot of guys is Jack Lambert, Pittsburgh Steelers in the 70s. You know, he, he was notorious, you know, uh, not a, so much a bad boy in the NFL, but just, just a, uh, you know, a blue collar, rock and sock him, middle linebacker. You know, Dick Butkus, who grew up on the south side of Chicago, one of my boys right here, was, I took elements of him, although he was a good guy. Um, and, and really, my protagonist is, he's a creation of the media and himself. So his... His alter ego was created, and and obviously he fanned it. He fanned the flames, but when when uh, tragedy befalls him, uh, in, in the form of uh, you know his his girlfriend uh, dying in, in the car accident, um, it's it's you know he gets uh, gets arrested. I, I hope I'm not going to reveal too much of the story. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to... But, no spoilers. Yeah, so anyway, tragedy befalls him. Tragedy befalls him. He's at his lowest point, and it's, it's his comeback story, or his attempted comeback story, and how he cleanses himself, and I think is important in his particular story, uh, part of redemption. Um, but uh, to your point, uh, you know, Athletes that come from that level of poverty, they get instant fame or their fame develops over time. I think that is, you know, uh, a phenomenon in, in, in pro sports, in, at least in our country, that that is perpetuated. Yeah. Um, I want to pause about talking on the specifics of the book. We can come back to it, but uh, I'm really curious because a lot of people who listen to the show are authors or aspiring authors. And right. it, it strikes me that you kind of made a pivot in in your career, you know, having worked in the Secret Service, and then you know to to releasing your first book uh, a year or so ago. Um, what was that process like for you making making that pivot from the time where you, you thought, hey, I, I might like to write a book, to actually getting it, finding a publisher, getting it published? What was that just journey like? Wow, I mean, it, it was a climb and. Um... You know, I was a secret writer. Um, you know, my wife, who was my editor, uh, was a school, a former school teacher, and I, I kept my writing a secret in the family for about 
five years. And I started writing a lot then in 2007. Well, as I said, you know, inspired by you know current events. And um, you know, I I've written investigative reports for the last four decades, so I'll say on and off. And, and you know, that's a process, that's a different style of writing. So I, I really had to learn how to um tailor my writing from you know telling the time instead of telling how to build a clock. You know, and, and I had to I learned a lot in the process. You know, I, I'm not a I'm a better technical writer now than when I started. You know, I, I could tell a story, I'm pretty creative and I'm I have creativity that allows me to, you know, to write fiction. Um, it, it, it was a difficult process because one of the things I discovered in writing investigative reports is you have to be factual, you know, chronological, chronology, factual. You've got to uh, validate what you're writing. In fiction, you, you take a lot more license, but you're really opening yourself up. You're putting yourself out there. You know, your your animal's thoughts, your feelings. So, like for me, the one kind of contains elements of romance, you know, which, you know, being a secret service agent, right? Uh, romance, uh, you know, not so easy. But, you know, I've, since then, I've also written a romantic comedy that, that uh, we're hoping, that we're hoping, like, like a holiday romantic comedy, uh, AKA, you know, Hallmark Sound. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I, you know, I, I, I had to diversify myself. You know, people want to say, so what's the better crime story? You know, you've been, you've been doing this long with professional life. And, and, but my first inspiration came to write the walk on, you know, a fiction, you know, a novel, and, and to incorporate, you know, these elements uh, that, that I still think of. But I think the other thing that was easy for me with the walk on is it's set in Chicago. Although there's a really cool chapter in life. Um, so I was able to capitalize on what I know. I, I remember when I took, you know, some courses in writing, um, you know, I was told, look, listen, most writers, you got to write what you know. And I think that was incorporated into the novel for me, which, which helped guide me, even though it was a, a creative work. I, I, had, I, I had some, you know, some elements at the build up. What helped you stay motivated during that process? So kind of going from being a, a secret writer to, right. you know, getting, getting the story out. I, I know I, I'm, I'm assuming if you're like me, there's some peaks and valleys with regards to motivation and, and creativity during that, that time period. What helped you stay motivated? So, you know, uh, again, like I, I had this, this basic premise and I, you know, I felt there were subsequent events that happened, both, like I said, in, 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 in different professional sports. I think that kept me, kept me focused. You know, I, and I'll be honest with you, there's a little bit, probably a lot of it, um, you know, protagonist DNA, we share the same DNA. Um, so I incorporated, I think, um, some of my own life experience into the character. But as far as motivation, as we mentioned, it's peaks and valleys. I mean, inspiration comes in chunks. I would find myself writing either very early in the morning or very late at night, or sometimes just you know formulating thoughts while I'm driving. You know, and I, I had a full time job too. I was in, in corporate America for about ten years uh, in, in corporate security with a with a Fortune one hundred company. So I really wrote catch as catch can, and my kids, you know, I coach little league, I coach uh, youth football with my son. You know, my daughter, you know, she was the uh, art symbol in theater and you know music and stuff like that. So I'm busy raising a family. Um, but I somehow got the inspiration. I, I had this finish line mentality that I had to, I had to finish the story. So let me fast forward a little bit. I did walk away from it for about a three-year period. And then kids went off to college you know, here in California, and I was just the wife and I serenade each other, and I said, no, I'm going to finish the book. So I actually finished it at Super Bowl Sunday, a 50-second Super Bowl, literally three hours before the game, and my protagonist wears number 52. So that's the Chicago Storm logo. You see the lightning bolt up, right? Yeah, very cool. Uh, 
you know, Muslim is only 52. Anyway, um, but I, I, uh, I was really excited to only design the cover because the publisher's uh, cover design, I think, really captured the essence of the story. It's so like uh, a little lady, and it's like walking along Lake Michigan during a football helmet. Um, you can want to make sure drive or something bad happens. <laughs> um, so I guess, like, you know, long story short, is uh, my inspiration came in chunks, and uh, I, I did revise a lot as, as I wrote. And my wife will tell you when I finally shared the story with her, um, she goes, Look, let me help you, let, let, me, let me read, read some of this. So she did. And when I finally turned and I finished and turned the manuscript over to her, it was like 600, almost 500,000 words. 500,000? Like, yeah, yeah. one piece. But but the reason that he had so many words is I wrote it in chunks and, you know, I, I was repetitive. So like I said, like, my technical skills were not that good. But the, the final uh, the final print, it was in 105. So she... She took the knife, the surgical knife to it, the scalpel, and did a really good job. And then, of course, you know, had that editor and, and the publisher that have been through as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I have I have this finish line mentality, probably will be a super service agent and reduce my personality and character that I finally is motivated to finish it. It sounds like you you've got something else that you've written, a uh, different genre. I, I'm curious, yeah. how um, what was the the difference in in sort of your approach to writing the second one versus the first? In other words, like what did you learn from the first that you could put into the second? Well, I learned I I learned um, like I said, um, I think I learned more about the technology of writing, you know, like sense structure. Foreshadowing, you know, the stuff that you need, you need, you know, skills and, and techniques that you need to write, especially, especially fiction. Um, I pivoted because uh, during COVID, during the height of COVID, my wife and I were sequestered, like most other people. We started watching a Hallmark Channel in these Christmas movies. You know, you know, and I'm like, we, we probably managed that, like 30 of them. And I'm like, and we were, I, I just got sucked in, you know, and, and I'm not a Romantic County kind of guy, although I, I do enjoy them. And I, I told my wife, I said, Teddy, I said, I could write this. So, so we'll go ahead, go, go write something. So I, I uh, had a story for Operation Santa Bear. And it's uh, it's about an L.A. cop and an emergency room nurse who meet at a children's charity event, a hospital charity event with a partner. And they give out little little Santa bears to sick kids at Christmas time. And it's very formulaic. Uh, and I wrote that one in about 18 months. Ooh, less. So it's it's edited. We actually have a, a screenplay uh that's finished. And um the main script is done, it just you know, I haven't I haven't it hasn't been formally edited yet. Did you? Uh, now, go, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was curious. Did you write the screenplay, or did somebody adapt it from no, your? I, I have help with that, but yeah. I've, I've since picked up some some skills some of that, and uh, it's a, it's a joint effort. My wife and, and another lady uh, who did the initial screenplay, but yeah, it's ready to go out. And I'm hoping to uh, get a picture early. Yeah, it's it's funny you mentioned that. I just uh, did an online workshop um, in July with with somebody who has written 15 or 16 movies for hallmark christmas wow. and um wow. you're kind of teaching the ins and outs of of writing in that genre and the approach to it um sort of the the formula that you have to follow because you're right it is very formulaic um but it was it was really fun i have to say it was really fun and uh i'm about halfway through that screenplay right now and uh oh wow yeah well, i got a little work for you I want to read it. And actually, I have uh, two, two, two sequels and like a spin-off series. They do series as well. So, you know, I, I know I'm jumping the gun. I'm way jumping it. And I actually were trying to get the walk-out pitch to the TV series for the limited yeah. series. 
Yeah, well, that was as, as far as writing, like you know, I I I opened up this Pandora's box now, and you know, I I wish I had more time to devote, um, you know, as the inspiration comes, but you know, I, I just uh, I feel I have stories to tell, and I'll be like, you know, let me find some, let me find some. So I do have a, a crime story in them, but you know, I have to. <laughs> yeah, well, just don't lose the the idea nuggets. You know, I have a no. uh, you know notes on my phone um, for everything, just so I don't so I don't lose them when the when the moment happens. Yeah, you know, I, I you know my inspiration comes at the oddest times. You know, I I'm active. You know, I'm in the gym and I'll be on a stair climber or you know, working out and something will pop in my head or I'm driving and I'm stuck in LA traffic. You know, I, I take my inspiration sometimes just from things I see. You know, I'll get inspiration for a story or, or some dialogue. And uh, to your point, yeah, I, I, have, a, I have notes on my phone. You know, uh, it's called easy if it's voice supporter. I'll, I'll, I'll do some good voice notes as well. Yeah, that's uh, I, I call that a gift and a curse. I mean, it's it's a gift because the ideas come to you. It's a curse because they sometimes come to you at inopportune moments. I'm I'm a runner, and oftentimes I'll be out out for a run, um, and then I'll have an idea, you know. Yeah. And then it's like then I'm like struggling to get my phone out and doing the voice memo thing, um, you know. So it's uh, but but you have to be open to the inspiration when it hits. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, we've got, we've got authors in, in the Secret Service, some of my colleagues have written books, there's other, you know, agents that have written books. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not a tall guy. I mean, I, I could probably write, write some fiction, you know, regarding my Secret Service experiences. Um, but I, uh, you know, as far as crime, crime fiction, I, I I like, uh, you know, the cold case litter stuff. Um, you know, think things along that line. But uh, I, I I get different inspirations that I've learned would fit in a different genres. Maybe there's some cross, cross all the things at all. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's you know, it, some people have different points of view on that where, you know, they some people will say, hey, once you establish your brand as an author, you have to stay in your lane, you know, and don't depart. If you're a thriller writer, you've got to stay in thriller or else you have to write under a pseudonym, you know, if you want to do uh, a romantic comedy or something. I, I like to, you know, think a little bit more broadly about it. I, you know, I think you should write what is interesting to you at the time. Um, and it's fun to try on different genres. I've written in comedy and I've written in thriller um, or mystery, probably more, more mystery than thriller, but. Um, you know, and I, and then I've written comedic mysteries. So it's like, I like to, I like to challenge myself a little bit. And it sounds like you're, you're open to, to exploring different avenues as well. Yeah. So you know, one of the things that I've done is um, I just, I'm trying to start a creative consulting practice for film and TV, limited to, you know, technical advisement for police procedure and um, uh, craft fiction, you know, maybe assistant writer for me. Um, you know, for procedural accuracy and, and even for inspiration. Um, one of the things you know, about the Secret Service, you know, we're a dual mission agency. Um, that can equate us with protection, obviously, protection of government officials. Um, but we also have criminal investigations. So um, I was a task force supervisor, meaning um, we we had a task force made up of other representatives of other law enforcement agencies under our umbrella. And I worked some very interesting both domestic and international criminal cases, which, you know, I think positions me as, as a subject matter expert in that regard. And so I'm trying to see if I could, uh, you know, carve a path in the thing out here in LA and, and uh, offer some of those services. For handling projects and, and also, you know, uh, So I'm curious. After you know, your your wife helps you cut about four hundred thousand words out yeah. and through content editing and and I'm sure line editing. 
Um, right. what, what was the process to find your publisher? How did how did that work? Because I'm sure some we, some people out there want to know. So, like, I went through. I probably submitted to shy of fifty query letters to uh, traditional literary agents, and I got the big guy, guy the literary agent. You probably seen him. He pays it. Thanks for like for sticking everywhere. So I probably submitted just under fifty query letters. Out of that, like a lot of first time writers, you know, you know, you know, JK Rowling, what? Good way. How many? Because she got picked up, right? For Harry Potter, you know, else's history. But um, I, I was not having success. And we went to the uh, USC, University of Southern California, Los Angeles Times Festival of Books in 2022. And there was a hybrid publisher there, uh, my publisher, Acorn Publishing, and I talked to Holly Kingmeyer, who's the, uh, you know, one of the, one of the uh, founders, and, you know, I talked to her a little bit. Um, and, and the good thing about them is, you know, I, I know independent publishing is, is allowed for a lot of people to take me now, but the thing about Acorn is you still got to submit, you got to get, you know, approved and, you know, picked up, right? Uh, so that's what I did. So that was uh, that was my uh, my route to get it published. Um, and and it's you know I, I think they're a great a great publisher. Uh, I, like a lot of people who write, you, you know you think that you know the next best seller, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's it's frustrating. You know it's frustrating that there's a lot of great writers out there just never get a chance. So I, I feel fortunate you know, I feel fortunate in that regard. Um, and, uh, you know, hope, hope, hope to see you get public in there. Yeah. Well, as long as, you know, they're, they're, it sounds like they're a good business partner for you in terms of, uh, you know, working with you and, um, you know, uh, helping you through that process. Cause it is, it is hard to do on your own. Um, it is because uh, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> you tend to make right, it. No. And, and I, I guess what I've learned is, you know, um, some of the, you know, some of the traditional publishers, you know, are, are going by the wayside and right, getting, you know, getting absorbed. And um, so really, the, you know, going the traditional route, especially for a new author, is, is it's, it's a big cloud. I mean, am I correct in mean, saying that? Yeah, hundred percent. I I could wallpaper. Yeah my wall with uh responses from query uh query letters um fortunately i i did wind up picking up a, a literary agent but um but that was after i'd written eight books wow. um so amazing. you know number nine looks like it'll be uh going the quote-unquote traditional route but we will uh, we will see so we went uh, we, we went to a writer's conference in san francisco we we're 11 in chicago at the time and I did a speed date, right? Speed dating in two minutes with you know, the literary agents. And I was five for five. I'm like, wow. You know, five people wanted, you know, wanted chapters or, you know, I forget what, you know, what each has. And I thought I would at least get one ball ball. You know, hey, you really interested, but you have to get an initial contact and submission, and, you know, not, nothing, nothing developed. So, I think that was my first very solo experience you know, <laughs> with, uh, with submission. Yeah. Um, there, there was another literary agent early on, and, and I sent him one of the whole manuscript, and, and I was encouraged, but then again, you know, nothing to write at all. So, yeah, that, that yeah, is. It was, it, you know, I've got some scars, so I love a lot of people, but I'm, I'm still inspired, and you know, I'm inspired. And, uh, I, I you know I've gotten writing awards, you know, for the walk Um and um, you know I, I, I try to I try to uh, get opportunities just like like this one, you know, to, to get out and talk about it. And, and I think this is a really good medium, especially for an author like myself, you know, to have this opportunity to uh, you know get to speak with you. Well, it's been a a great opportunity on, on my part. I loved getting to hear your story. I'm curious. Um, Richard, where where can people learn more about you if they want to look at you on social media or or a website? What do you got? Yeah, so so like I have uh, an author's website. It's uh, richard.com. Um 
Uh, all my contact information is there. I'm on, some, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, um, LinkedIn. Uh, I, I've been interviewed on in a couple other podcasts, and I also um, submitted, I was interviewed for Voyage LA and Shout Out LA uh, regarding the book. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm available on social media. And, and also, uh, if you can contact me through my website, richard.com, which is a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, you know, having, having a long last name, you talk about writing under a pseudonym or a pen name, you know, I don't know. But, uh, but no, I'm, not, I'm proud to have my name and I'm going to do it for yeah, well, I'll be sure to put all those links in our show notes so people won't have to write them down and they can just tap on their screen to find you. So, Richard, I will say uh, thank you for stopping by and corking your story and letting me uncork yours. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. And I uh, wish you all I uh, wish you all the best with your endeavors, both personally and professionally. And, um, you know, thanks again. Perhaps we'll have another chance to talk another time. I hope maybe about a Christmas rom-com. Yeah, man, it's 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 a good, it's a call. It's a good story. It's a, it's a good story. LA and Chicago. So, yeah, ironically, my last plug is I'm thinking of doing my own podcast called Second Cities, um, which is going to be between Chicago and LA, who live for Second City status all the time behind New York, and just um, you know talk about sports, talk about food, you know, kind of compare both cities, what's going on in the entertainment world. So. I might, that might be uh, a future endeavor of mine as well. There you go. Well, I wish you all the best. Okay. Mike, thank you so much. And have a great day. <laughs>